streaming now. We're going to give people a second to get here. And we're going to talk about this book. And it's going to be a lot of fun for everybody. Maybe. Hopefully. Mm. Let me get my notes out. This is the things I do for you people. Oh. Give people a second to get in here. It is a lovely Tuesday night. Tuesday, yeah. When you don't have a day show anymore, uh, weekdays are meaningless, I'm learning, in a very, very good way. So we're going to give it to 100 people here. And then we are going to get going with this book review. Um, hola. I can't speak French. Okay, we got 100 people here. So let's talk about this book. This is a book. And what I thought of it. And this is, spoiler alert, it's well writ well written. I'm glad I read it. There's a lot I'm going to talk about with this book because it makes, it's a good, there's lots here to um, think about. So let me talk about the book, why I'm reading it, who this person is, and, and so on and so forth. I, should, I wish I could put it somewhere so that people can, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, whatever. Um, anyway, so I was on Twitter and some blue check was making some dopey comment about Trump, which they are wont to do. And it was something to the effect of, um, oh, you know, Biden should do this and then Trump's going to be jealous. And I made the comment, I quote tweeted it, and I said, like the amount of times these people think about Trump and these kind of high school boyfriend fantasies, like, oh, I'm going to make him jealous is really uh, like off the charts. And she replied and we went back and forth. And here's my... Here's my rule. Um, then she, at some point she's like, you should read my memoir. Now, I there's a they did something called Game Theory, but I forget what it's called, Prisoner's Dilemma. And they ran several, um, I, don't, I don't know. They ran several iterations of like, what's the best strategy for dealing with their people? And this is the strategy I use in my own life, which is treat people as they are treating you. If someone comes at you as a jackass, hit them back twice as hard. But if someone is showing vulnerability, especially in social media, take that opportunity and, and be kind to them to some extent, unless they are trying to backpedal. And she just said, you should read my memoir. And I said, and I, I said, now this would be an opportunity for someone who's of a lower quality person to be like, your memoir is going to suck and obviously terrible, which is not true. Someone could be unfunny on Twitter and have a great memoir or vice versa. There's something that's annoying about presidential debates. Just because someone's a bad debater does not mean they would be a bad leader. A good leader, you can imagine, is sitting there. Any president is going to have very little information about the different departments. There's so much going on. Sits there, makes informed decisions. Here's everyone out. Not quick on their feet. That's okay. Um, so I knew – so basically uh, her whole deal is she was – a writer comedy writer for many many different venues and let me just read off the cover ncis the si oh so then she said to me if you saw the blowfish episode of the simpsons i wrote that then she played the right card when you're talking about like men my age white men my age because that really is like something that hits close to our heart and that episode had been bothering me for uh 30 years now because the annoying thing about the episode for those of you who haven't seen it this was a very early episode is that um, Homer goes, they go to the sushi restaurant, the guy, the chef cuts the puffer fish for fugu, and Homer gets food poisoning from this, and he's going to die in a day. First of all, the fish that they showed for what they're preparing for fugu is, fugu is not the actual fish that they use. They showed a porcupine fish, which is a different family than fugu, which is puffer fish. They both inflate Porcupine fish are tetrodon today. Puffer fish are diodon today. They look quite different, although there are similarities. And most most importantly, porcupine fish are covered in spines. 
puffer fish are not. They're just covered in little bristles. They look very different. So that bothered me for 30 years as a fish, fish person. The other thing that really bothered me about that episode is, and this is not just exclusive to that episode. This happens like Aquaman comics and everything. They, when they go to cut the fish, the chef, the fish was like a ball, like a balloon, and it deflates. You will often see in the literature that puffer fish can inflate with air or water. And this should drive you as crazy as it drives me because how is something underwater going to find air to inflate with? That's not, you're underwater. If there was air, you wouldn't have be able to drown. You would just grab the air. There is no air underwater. They do not inflate with air. Now, if you pull them out of the water and they start trying to inflate, yes, they will inflate with air in that sense. But that's like saying, yeah, if you hold someone's head underwater, they'll breathe water. They're not breathing water. They're drowning. So this really is something very annoying about porcupine fish that you see a lot. Okay, so let's talk about this book. It uses farts from whales. Okay, that's great, great stuff. So let's talk about this book. So what's interesting about this, I made sure to order a copy, and the copy came signed, which is sad, which means the person didn't even want it. And, I, and that to me is, I, like, I don't like that. Like, if someone has signed a book for someone, I want them to have it on their shelf or, or give it to somebody. She's gotten her, she got a lot of great um, blurbs on the back which is really a red flag for this book is probably going to be terrible. And it wasn't terrible. Here's a little pro tip. When you hear someone say this book laughed out, I laughed out loud. In this case, John Oliver, they're lying. They probably have not read the book because think about how often when you read a book, you laugh out loud. People who identify, Oh, I laughed out loud are like the people who listen to NPR and things that are droll. And they're like, <laughs> like that's the kind of thing. It's very rare. So when you see a book being described as laugh out loud, you can usually assume that it's it's clever, but it's not funny. Um, so the problem she had, I had a few questions about how she was, oh, so what happened is she said, you should read my memoir. And I said, I'm not gonna read this for free. If people wanna chip in 500 bucks, I'll read it. And within half an hour, that happened, especially thanks to Patricia, chipped in like 300. So now I'm like, all right, I'm gonna read it. Um, one of the, so as someone who works on, first of all, I absolutely hate this cover and I'll tell you why I hate this cover because it has that bad Photoshop of hands, which is exactly like those direct to DVD movies where it's like the actor on a body that's clearly not theirs. And it looks so cheap and tacky. And that's not as, I guess it's on brand because she wrote Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves, which I think was either direct to video or or such like Showtime or some garbage like that. Um, and that's no disrespect to her. Like this is something else that I hate when people talk about like, like they make fun of one hit wonders. It's like, oh, you only wrote one song that everyone likes and gives them joy. So yeah, maybe it's a direct to DVD like movie. So people enjoyed it. So more power to her. I'm just saying it does look less, it, it doesn't look classy. Uh, she talks about NCIS, The Simpsons, Monk. I don't think she even talks about Monk in the book. Murphy Brown, The Kennedy Center Honors, The Muppets, Newhart, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, which she created, which is, again, a show I would not find watchable, but it's a major accomplishment to have created a show, that, especially the one that had that much legs. Coach, Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves, Charmed, and Late Night with David Letterman. So one of the issues I had is, okay, like I before I, I started reading it, I thought to myself, how would I write this book because you have a big there's several ways to do a book like this and this is what people don't often understand there are when you're writing a book there's no one right way to do it just like with clothes there's not one right way to dress it's about choices and being able to defend them uh, what i was concerned with this book which she did not do thankfully was something like Tina Fey's Bossy Pants. Now, Tina Fey's Bossy Pants sold a huge amount of number of copies, blah, 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 it's a huge success. Fine. Looking at it from a critical point of view, why I didn't, what bothered me a lot about that book, and other reviewers mentioned this as well, is you don't get to know Tina Fey. There are a series of essays, and Tina Fey is very funny and very observant, and it's very uh, uh, hilarious in that regard. But in terms of, okay, you're the woman writing the table, uh, writing the writing, writing, running the writing staff at SNL. 
what's that like? What's that room like? Put me in that room. She doesn't do it. She never breaks her facade, Tina Fey. She's always on. And as a result, you don't really get to know her as a person. Now, Bossy Pants isn't trying to be an autobiography. Um, and this is kind of more of a memoir than an autobiography. It's not comprehensive. It's not trying to be. But one of the big issues that I would have faced if I was working on this book is, all right, you've got this huge resume. How are you going to implement it into a memoir? Thank you, Brandon. And that is a tough, tough question. And she handled it. Have you heard of Yanmi Park? Yes, of course I have. Yeah. Uh, I, I've, I've been in contact with her. Uh, and there's a photo of her holding up my book on Facebook. Anyway, the first chapter, and this is often how um, books are sold. So basically, when you write a book proposal, you write what the book outline is going to be, and you include a sample chapter. And very often, that first um, uh, chapter that's in the book proposal becomes the first chapter of the book. This is what it felt like she did. I don't know if that's what she did do. But the very beginning, the introduction, is her saying, who is Nell Scavell? So she has to explain to us, okay, who am I and why are you reading my book? Which is that's exactly the right thing to do in my view. It's, okay, why am I reading? I've not heard of you, which is not a, a lot. I mean, listen, you have a huge resume, but you're not a household name. She recognizes this. And she explains why her career, who she is, and why you should read about her. And that's blatantly, she's blatantly owning it. So that's very uh, smart on her part. Um, let me go through my notes because I took notes as I went through. The question I wondered was, okay, if you have a resume that's that big, you can't really give that much attention to each of the different shows because it's going to be very cursory. And she does a good job of getting into detail uh, as much as she can on the different um, subjects. For example, the best chapter I thought by far was she, on when she, that Simpsons episode she did. So she goes through from beginning to end exactly how a Simpsons episode gets developed from conception to execution. So it was really, including ending, endings that they cut, jokes that they cut, they really, she really did a great job explaining to the fans, all right, this is what that, that experience is going to be like. Hold on, let me get my notes on the rest of this. It's also very well written in a corporate sense, meaning it is engaging, fast read, entertaining, and a, a bit soulless. You don't really get to know her as a person other than a few little things but again that's a choice you no one knew who she was coming in so it's not really important who she is coming out it's important what she saw and what she experienced and that she talks about at a fair amount of length um let me get my notes open here one second folks okay this is gonna take forever when did i start reading this Okay, this, this really bothered me. So one of the things that she talks about throughout the book fairly is that females who are writers and females who are comic writers don't get the same cred that men do and it's unfair. And it drove me crazy that very early on, she says other writers insist, I hate writing, but I love having written. That line is always ascribed let me just double check who actually said it, because at the very least, even if it's a false attribution, she should at least have given that person. Okay, I'm not finding off the top of my head. Oh, here we go. Quote investigator. Hmm. Okay, so that line is almost always, apparently incorrectly, uh, ascribed to Dorothy Parker, who was probably the first American comic writer 
She was the, I talk about her a bit in the new right. She was the subject of a movie where Jennifer Jason Lee played her, Mrs. Parker and the Vicious Circle. Um, so to have that quote and not attribute it even falsely to Dorothy Parker really bothered me. And she should have known better. Um, so that, but that's a minor thing. Here's the other, see, this is another thing this bothered me. So she's talking about what it's like to be a female comic writer. And by the time she's like 26, she's divorced twice, but that's, it takes up one page and it's like, hold on. If you're going to have us empathize and sympathize with you and understand your perspective, you're young, you're in New York, you've been through two divorces. Don't just laugh that off. That's got to be a big deal. Like, I want to know more about that if I'm going to have some kind of feelings for you as a, as a protagonist. So when she just like, oh, blah, 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 I was just like, that, that really, uh, really bothered me. Um, so she also says, so she started writing for Spy Magazine in the 80s. Uh, late 80s. So Spy Magazine was very much a seminal aspect of like, pre. it was a blog before there were blogs. It was a magazine. It was very much about sneering at celebrities, very much pre-gawker gawker. At the same time, she says, you could arguably trace the origin of the snark ages back to Spy. I would trace it back to the Algonquin Roundtable where Dorothy Parker was a member in the 20s. Now that kind of faded away, but uh, Spy definitely has, uh, is a magazine that punched above its weight culturally if that makes sense. Okay, the other thing she had is pieces of advice, you know, for people who are starting out trying to be writers, which I thought is really a smart idea. But the first piece of advice just blew my mind. She said, never be afraid to write on spec, and she, meaning write for free. And she said, the first piece of advice is gold. There are so many reasons to write on spec. I have never, I'm no, sorry, I will never, ever, ever write on spec. It is so there's several reasons. One is a lot of times people will have great opportunities for you and they will want to have something to shop around, but they don't have a budget yet. If they can't find the budget to uh, pay the person to write the perspective or the outline or the proposal, the odds are very low because you know how much work it takes to get a project from idea to execution. There's so many dominoes. If you can't afford the first domino, the odds that you're going to be able to raise the money for the 10th and 12th, each level, it's hard, you know, it gets harder and harder to make that thing uh, uh, happen. So if you can't get the first one, odds are exponentially high that you're not going to get it through to completion. I'm putting my heart and soul to something um, that's time that I've wasted and, and uh, losing. And if they don't respect me enough to pay me for my work now, they're not going to respect me when I'm on the staff. It's really, I, I, my experience, which is not hers, hers is valid for her, I would say, never, ever, maybe when you're starting out, I, I can't speak on that, but at a certain point, don't ever work for free. It's humiliating. You do with Twitter for your direct audience. No, what work at spec means is you call me up and you say, hey, I want you to write a book proposal for me. Not for me, for them. Fuck you. I'm not writing for you. She says, I become a better writer every time I finish a script, so it never feels like a waste of time. But you can be writing that script for yourself and selling it under your name. She goes, over the years, I've completed seven full-length movies on spec. It sold two. One was produced, and I'm holding out hope for the rest. That's like three out of seven. So that's four scripts that went nowhere. That's That, that makes no sense to me. But again, her, her experience is different from my own or Twitter. Thank you. Okay. So there's one line that I thought was very, very funny, um, which is she talks about, she was working on the Smothers Brothers show, which she doesn't put on the cover, even though there's a whole chapter about them. So the Smothers Brothers were this pair of brothers from the late sixties. They were like kind of this uh, counterculture figures increasing on the show. They got canceled. They brought them back. I think CBS and Mama Cass was from the Mamas and the Papas, um, and she's the, oh, the heavy one. And th there was some comment about Mama Cass in the press or somewhere, and Nell goes to one of the Smothers Brothers. She should have had the soup. 
because the rumor is Mama Cass choked to death on a ham sandwich. And he turns around and goes, Cass was amazing, and I loved her. It's like, calm down. And she says, he was right to scold and remind me that an important rule of comedy is know your audience. That's true. Time and a place. Um, but I don't think he was right to scold her at all. I think he could have been like, come on. Because it was, at this point, 20 years later. Um, this is what really bothered me. This is what really bothered me. So one of the things she talks about a lot in the book, and she brings receipts, which I thought she did very well, was talk about what it's like for women in these rooms and in this culture. Um, and so, she, and you know, we always often hear in the press about conspiracy theories, right? Oh, this is a conspiracy, conspiracy. Oh, it's, and conspiracy theory is shorthand for we don't have to talk about it anymore. And she goes, predatory behavior often becomes an open secret. In the 90s, female assistants at William Morris would warn one another not to get into an elevator with Bill Cosby. In 2005, Courtney Love was asked to give advice to any young girls planning a move to Hollywood. She responded, Harvey Weinstein invites you to a private party in the Four Seasons. Don't go. Many co-workers, agents, lawyers, and managers looked the other way while the assaults continued. My point is, how dare the people in this culture tell anyone else how to look, live their lives or talk about any kind of sexual harassment? There is a big, there's layers of evil. And, and bad things. There is an enormous difference between having an affair with your secretary, which is inappropriate, and two co-workers getting drunk, the girl's not having in the moment, that is a gray rape, and what Bill Cosby did. Like, these are so orders of magnitude worse from one another. So, for these people, to be like they all, they all, that's the thing people need to appreciate. They all knew. They all knew about these people. No one did anything other than warn each other. What about the girl who didn't get warned? How many women did cause me drug rape over decades? They all knew. Just watch out, honey. Just despicable, despicable people. Um, This is also funny. There was one scene where uh, she's friends with Penn Jillette, has been for many years uh, to this day. And, uh, and this, I'm sure she asked him for permission to include this anecdote. At one point, Penn invites her to see a sex show as, as friends. They're platonic. And she goes, I had no idea what to expect walking to the show. We passed rows of near naked women in stalls and I noted the place reeked of bleach. That's not bleach, Penn informed me. That's the smell of cum. People think these places clean with bleach. They don't. So I thought that was funny that she did include that and, and was that graphic about it. Uh. The problem is she's also one of these progs. And in their algorithm, they are very... Um, it, it, let me just read you this and you can see how it, it's, the, it's the ideology at work and, and it's a, lack of, uh, a profound lack of critical thought. There's no doubt that my privileged background and skin color helped me get the job. Years later, I was working on a short-lived sitcom with the stunningly talented Larry Wilmore. Larry Wilmore is not stunningly talented. Larry Wilmore had the show. He was the replacement for Colbert after Colbert went to take over Letterman after The Daily Show. It was a disaster and it failed. He's not amazingly talented. He's perfectly adequate. Uh, one day, Larry and I got into a friendly argument about who had it tougher in TV writers' rooms, women or African-Americans. You can probably guess who took which side. That's so odd. So each person is taking the side that would make them the bigger victim and therefore give them social advantage. Well, that's, that's, why would I be able to guess that? Larry and I argued our cases to a stalemate. We did, however, agree on one thing. African-American women had it the hardest. Yeah, it's just so tough. Um, so there's that. This is what's amazing. This is what's amazing. And what people need to realize is calling out hypocrisy with these types will never get you anywhere. Because that's there in their faith. It's salvation through faith, not through works. You're a good person because you have the right ideas, not because you do the right things. 
So let me read you this, which is just absolutely amazing. So she uh, did Sabrina, the Teenage Witch, which I'm sure many of you have seen. I'd never worked on a show with so many high-level women. I should have been more inclusive. The Sabrina room had some diversity, a disabled writer. What does that mean? How's that diverse one? A writer married to a Latino. Of course I'm diverse. I got a black wife at home. It's diversity. Diversity. My wife at home. Latino. I'm married to a Mexican lady. Therefore, there. Quotas filled. It's diverse. But we didn't have any writers of color. So the one time she has an opportunity to practice what she preaches, what am I going to do? Call Larry Wilmore? He's amazingly talented. He would never take my call. Um, I have to give her credit for being honest about this. She goes, I'm aware of all the excuses I could make to justify the homogeneity, but they've all been made against me on male-centric shows. I had the opportunity to include more voices and I didn't make enough of an effort. That was a mistake. See, when other people do it, you don't call it a mistake. You call it a sin, a flaw, burn them down, they're horrible. But the one chance you had to do it, it's like, can we, okay, we can't find one funny Spanish person. My wife's Spanish. Okay, check. Okay, we need someone, a man who likes dick. Anyone, any guys like dick? Okay, we got that here. The cast was all white too. This is what's amazing. The only fucking black person on uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch was the cat. They got pitched Cicely Tyson. Cicely Tyson. This isn't some random asshole down the street. This is one of the great actresses of all time. And they said, nah, we don't need a black lady. We we'll just get some random white chick to play one of the ants. Can you believe this shit? And then it's like, whoa, all these shows have too many white people on it. Cicely Tyson. Nah, I should have jumped at the chance. Yeah, you think? Instead, we were zoning in on Caroline Ray. Caroline Ray's great. Every show she does, she, she's a consummate professional. If this mattered to you at all, who has more credit? If this mattered to you at all, diversity? Have Cicely Tyson come in. Make a part for her. Cicely, I, I, it's, it's amazing. But they will never, here's the thing. If you sat her down and said, this was really screwed up. Do you see how you don't practice what you preach at all? She'd be like, yeah, I'm a bad person. And we'll continue the ideology exactly the same. Okay. There's that. This is amazing. So one of the other things in her um, progressive faith is the view that basically all humans are the same, except they're not. So when if it's a, if it benefits uh, your faith, people are different. When you don't want it to benefit, they're the same. For example, we need more people of color on writing staffs. It makes it funnier. I think that's true. I do think it's true that different people from different backgrounds, if you're talking about humor, will have different senses of humor. The wasp sense of humor versus the Jewish sense of humor versus the black sense of humor versus the gay sense of humor. These are not the same. And male and women, these are not the same. So she's absolutely right in that regard. This is amazing. But if you're going to have a show where a lot of the jokes are pop politics, do you think maybe, maybe, maybe there were just one Trump person? Just one. Just one person who thinks Hillary's bad. Just one out of 10. You'll never hear them say that. So you want people to uh, be cast the way you want the world to look like. But if you're talking about different jokes from different backgrounds, no, 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 no. You can't that. You're kidding? We're going to have hate speech on the show? That's unconscionable. We need to free ourselves from the cultural belief that women are better at raising children than fathers. In the deepest way possible, I can tell you that is not true. First of all, you're not in a position to make that claim. I'm absolutely sure it's fair to say for her, her husband did a better job raising or equal job raising her kids. I, If she says that, I believe her, it's fine. She's one data point. The claim that this is a cultural belief, what culture on earth, literally anywhere, 
do people not think that women are better at raising children than fathers? On what culture on earth? Anywhere, 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 anywhere. It is only in evangelical progressive faith that men and women are as good as at raising children. That is the only place on earth where that is culturally the view. Everywhere else it's regarded as either biological or whatever, something like that. But if something is universal, there tends to be some reason behind it. Um, da -da -da. This is what's funny. She goes, 30 years later, there are still too many shows looking for a female writer and a minority writer. Some don't even get that. Uh, and she mentions how there's one show she's working on and they've only re already got two women on staff, so they won't be looking to hire another. One of the consequences of when you make everything about hiring about so much about gender, about race, then people just want you to shut up. They'll do what it takes to mollify you and they'll move on. And that ends up hurting talented women and minorities as things go on. That said, I'm not familiar with her world. So if she is saying it's as bad in her world as she's portraying. I will defer to her judgment. This is, this is the, my favorite line in the book. And this is when I was cheering for her, like actually cheering. So she wrote an article for the New York Times about sexism at the Late Show with David Letterman, where she left after five months, uh, because it came out that Dave Letterman was having affairs with like interns, and there was like a big backlash about this. Some people were defending him. Some people were saying, "Look, you, you're, you got this 23-year-old giving you show notes like an executive producer because you're banging her. That's not what." Do, and this disadvantages people who aren't banging you. It's it's really not acceptable. Uh, and he kind of laughed it off. And she wrote a whole piece about that. And they went and damage control and they said she was fired and she was angry and she's bitter and all that stuff. And when she just replied, I thought this was such a great line. And I was so impressed with her as a person, not sarcastically at all. She says, the late show can say anything they want about me, just hire more women. So for her to be like, fine, I'm horrible, I'm garbage, I don't care, just do the right thing. That to me is being ethical at its highest. When you're like, I don't matter here. This is about a bigger principle that I'm uh, I'm fighting for. So I thought that was really instead of and they're assassinating her character publicly. She's like, it's this isn't about me. Do the right thing. Very impressed with that. This is something else that was kind of funny. She worked on a show called Warehouse 13, which I've never heard of. Apparently, it was Sci-Fi's biggest Sci-Fi Channel's biggest show. And one of the people in that show was CCH Pounder, an actress. She had earlier mentioned in the book that she was worked on some pilot about women in jail. What she doesn't know is there was a very short-lived six-episode show on Fox in like 85 when Fox was just starting called Women in Prison. And CCH Pounder was one of the prisoners. And I don't think she know, makes that connection, so it's kind of funny. Um, there was another great, great line in here. Uh, she, so she goes through Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In which of course I'm not the audience for. It seems to me that it appeals to the worst kind of person. That doesn't at all mean that that book is low quality. If I had to bet money, I bet you it's high quality. Uh, she clearly knows how to write in a very professional way. Uh, it, it's just, it's formulaic, but it's, it, she gets the job done. And I'm not using that word entirely in a, as a pejorative. So Gloria Steinem is meeting with Sheryl Sandberg and Nell. And it's, she's talking about how there's like tens of thousands of young girls missing in India. Like it just like the things that we, it's just horror show. And Nell is like, I can't believe I care about getting women hired on late night TV when that's going on in India. And Gloria Steinem touches her hand and goes, you worry about late night TV, I'll worry about India. And this is the thing that I also thought about when I was working about the North Korea stuff when people like, I don't care about North Korea. I'm like, that's fine. Like not everyone can care about anything. All we can do is make the world a little bit better than when we came here, that's it. So the idea that everything has to be everyone's responsibility is bullshit. If you just take in a stray animal, talk to a kid who's lonely, your, your work is done. Like that's fine. So not everything has to be everyone's problem. And I really was impressed that Gloria Steinem gave her that freedom to be like, you, you worry about your thing. I'll worry about the bigger thing. It's, it's fine. So I thought that was really cool. 
she included what I consider to be one of the worst jokes in history. And I'm really shocked that she included it as an example of wit, because to me, this is really, I think you could spend a good half hour reverse engineering why this book, this joke is so offensively bad and embarrassingly bad. Lily Tomlin has been telling this joke for 40 years. And the joke is, I worry about things like, if peanut oil comes from peanuts and olive oil comes from olives, then where does baby oil come from? I hate that joke. And I've got dead baby jokes in the new right. I have dead baby jokes, you know, I could give you nine months of them. I hate this joke. And this, this, this is so droll at best. It really, really bothers me that she uh, included as an example how Lily Tomlin is funny. And it's like, I'm embarrassed for you. Um, this is what's really amazing. So she starts talking about Trump and how she wrote Obama's lines for the Kennedy Center honors. And her the lines she wrote were great. Like they're uh, not too out there, but this is the president. The president can't get too radical or the former president at least. She did a solid job and she was all excited that Obama is reading her jokes. She should be. What an amazing accomplishment. Very impressed. Then she talks about Trump. Comedy requires empathy. A joke works because it builds off a shared feeling or perspective. Let's go earlier in the book, shall we? Okay. When she's not talking about Trump and when she's talking about comedy in general. She says, hold on, let me get the exact quote. By the way, if you are someone who wants to write a memoir, this would be a good book to reverse engineer. It would be a good book to reverse engineer because it's done in such a, a, like a good skeleton outline that if you figure out what she did, you'd be able to follow it. You'd do a good job. So it's really solid in that regard. Hold on. Let me find you what she wrote. Because I only registered what she said earlier after she said the Trump stuff. So I never went back. The meanest jokes rarely make it in rarely make it into the script, although they often make the room laugh the hardest. So there she talks about that. And hold on. There's more. Where is it? Here we go. Some view motherhood as the antithesis of funny, since moms are associated with gentleness, nurturing, and safety, while comedy wants to be twisted, dangerous, and mean. So she says comedy wants to be mean, broadly speaking. True. Then, when she's talking about Trump, Trump clearly finds humor in, in the misfortune of others. He once retweeted a doctored video of him hitting a golf ball and knocking Clinton over. It's schadenfreude with a laugh track. So when Trump's mean, it's not really funny. But when anyone else is comedy, it's, it's funny. The other thing is this doctored video. It's, am it's amazing how someone as bright as her Someone who understands carefully chosen words and how a, a word can make a joke land or fail uses that expression, Dr. Video. For those of you who haven't seen what she's referring to, I have. It's basically two three-second clips stuck together where the first is Trump swinging his golf club and the next shot, Hillary is falling over. It's as if he swung the golf ball and knocked her over. It's, and for her to condemn that, that is literally like every video on America's Home Video, America's Funniest Home Videos, which is the stupidest shit on TV ever, and which everyone laughs at because it's so lowest common denominator. But when he does it, it's a doctored video. So we, I've covered on Twitter a lot how this expression doctored video is used for memes. And the fact that they all use the same specific term shows you that this isn't a mind at work, but an algorithm being programmed by their superiors. Um, and that was the, okay, that was the last thing I had from the, from her. So 
Um, I thought it was well written, interesting. Um, I don't regret reading it at all. Um, I don't know that I agree with her perspective. I would have liked more receipts. I thought, you know, a lot of the philosophy is, is beyond vapid, but when it got personal and she was talking about things and how she uh, approached those issues, I thought she did a great job. So uh, kudos to her. Um, and uh, I, it, it's much better than the Kamala Harris book. Uh, I'll tell you that. And I'm not surprised. I told her right away, even though we're going into it Twitter, that I'm sure this is going to be very well written and it's perfectly fine. So that is that. Uh, 40 minutes on that book. Uh, if we want to talk about other stuff, we can. Let me see if I... Hold on a second. Let me see if some of the chats already vanished. Okay. Not quite on topic, but sorry, but I was pretty black-pilled. Your content pulled me out of... Oh, that's lovely. Well, I'm glad it did. Um, I can only go back so far with the chats, guys. So, okay. They talk about slavery and diversity, but they never talk about hiring ex-convicts that were literally slave labor for the feds. That's true. Progressive equals your equal is equals is my oh yeah 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 right okay there's that what historical figure do you think gets the most undeserved bad reputation okay there's people I can say who get a worse reputation than they deserve but they're still bad people undes I mean would it be I don't think Hamilton has a bad reputation. Who gets the most undeserved bad reputation? Hmm. Oh, uh, I'll say Neville Chamberlain. Because, you know, he's always made fun of for appeasing Hitler and leading way to World War II. <coughs> we have to keep in mind his context. They just had the Great War. People are coming home mutilated. And you can see him being like, look, another war is not on the table. I'm not losing an entire generation of young men. That we're not having it. So I don't fucking care what it costs. This is not. We're not doing it again. Now it had the other consequence, but you could. I think his thinking is pretty understandable in many ways in retrospect. Um. Okay. Show feet. Okay. Here you go. Besides Rand, what fiction do you cherish? Cherish Well, um, my favorite writer is E. Nesbitt. She's a British children's writer. Uh, I would say that would probably be my biggest one. And like Edward Eager, a lot of those children's magical realism books mean a lot to me. Um, if you go to look at my Goodreads, you can sort it by, by uh, rating. There's very few. Fiction, it takes a lot. I just read The Street by Anne Petrie, which I thought was very good. Nesbitt. Don't have a bunch of money at the moment, but you make me a better person, so thank you. <laughs> okay. Please do a shot of liquor with me if you have some. I'm not, I do not drink. It makes me meaner and it gets me hungover, uh, but I'll do a shot of Coke Zero, which was Scott Pilgrim drink. Can we spite fund you to buy jenniferrubin.com? Well, I do own johnobrennan.com, and that redirects to Trump. Um, I was just talking to Dave Rubin today. Uh, I think, Jennifer, I mean, that's going to be exorbitant. What I am going to be doing now, I, I'm enjoying reading. I'm enjoying this, reading these. I'm getting some old, like 19th century, uh, like slave, uh, pro-slavery books. Going to read those. Get original copies, like three hundred dollars, and then discuss them because corporate history doesn't talk about just how bad things were back in the day. Um, just bought Sun and Steel for under $100. What are your thoughts on Yukio Mishima? I, I'm not familiar with him at all. Um, talk about the interview with Lex. I mean, it was four hours. I didn't, you didn't get enough there. It was a lot of fun. He's a great, great dude. Um, and I'm glad I, I, glad I got to poke him a bit about being a robot. In foreign policy, should national sovereignty be prioritized? Um, lest the cathedral export its values. The ex cathedral is going to export its values. I, I, I think national sovereignty is a very weak. Um, like North Korea is all about national sovereignty, right? So it, it, use, it can be used to really cover up the worst atrocities. 
Uh, but I do think it should be at the same time, if it, it's a good excuse to be like, you know, we can't just invade anywhere we want. We got to respect some people's uh, boundaries to some extent. So it's kind of a weak tool, I think. Trump surviving COVID better or worse politically? Well, I think being alive usually tends to benefit you politically. But what do I know? Um, what type anarchist are you? I am an anarchist without adjectives, and I currently have Alexander Berkman's book, Prison Memoirs of Anarchists, signed from 1912 en route to my house from the Netherlands. Every, t <laughs> Every time I speak of the Twilight Princess fans, I do so with great love and affection. They cannot help the fact that they were born fucked up. I, I read, I just finished watching the Twilight Princess playthrough. I really hated it. I really hate that Link was a werewolf, I hated that he was Spider-Man. Uh, it seemed there was not much of a plot. I hated that little girl, whatever her name was, uh, talking all weird uh, with that weird body. I just did not like any aspect of it at all. It was, it was well, visually, it was nice, but that was about it. Um, enjoyed your interview with Lex and Tim. I'd love to see an expert from China, interview with China expert Joshua Phillip. I got Douglas Murray coming to the studio on Thursday, we also have Kurt Metzger and Dave Smith. So that's the next few uh, coming up. VP debate stream. Yes, of course. Um, it says a lot about his academia and tech entourage that he seems to be genuinely surprised by the cathedral and lack of democracy. democracy thoughts. Oh, Lex. Um, I don't, I don't think it says about his entourage. I just think it says about his path he's had in life in, in that's been his road. So if this has been your road and you haven't really seen much of it, otherwise you're going to be, have some sort of blinders on. Um, do you hate Twilight Princess less or more than Majora's Mask? I, I like Majora's Mask much more, much, much more than Twilight Princess. Some new right even support China because they feel the cathedral needs to be kept in check no matter what the enemy. And they prefer CCP to LGBT thoughts. This is not going to be a... This, 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 is my, this is my answer to you. So there, my thoughts. Um, what, do you, what do you mean? You didn't like post-transition Batmite? I don't know what that means, cool thing. What do you mean post-transition? You mean post-crisis? So, um, why are they different colors all of a sudden? I don't understand. Do you recommend any books on warfare? I don't have any that I can recommend. Uh, I'm not a big warfare person. Um, e. Nesbitt was a co-founder of the Fabian Society. Oh, yeah. So, she had two books that she wrote with her husband under the pseudonym of Fabian Bland. And uh, so she was a hardcore Fabian. Oh, absolutely. Uh, she also has a book called Ballads and Lyrics of Socialism. It was a signed copy that I passed on on eBay. Does the meteorite live with you now? Absolutely, I'm looking at it right now. It's right in there in the, in the bedroom. Are you getting George Fitzhugh's book? I'm not familiar with him. George Fitzhugh, probably not, does not sound like, um, Oh, this is, oh, okay. No, no, no. I have books. Of, I got what you're saying. Okay. Oh, this is interesting. I'll, I should add this to my list. What are his books? Cannibals All. I think I read him. I read something like this. Let me see if I read him already. There was a book I read that was similar to this, which is an apologetic for, uh, for, um, Slavery, because their whole point was the North was engaged in wage slavery. And Southern slavery was a family. In the North, it's more evil. Was it his that I read? My books. This is definitely something I should add to the list. Yep, I read it. It was ex excruciating. I read Cannibals All. That was the one I read. It was really unreadable. Color is based on dollar amount spent. It's not, though, because the red ones are like, I guess they change the colors. Love that Lex interview. What do you consider your favorite album? Ooh. Might be. Ugh, that's such a tough question. 
it might be, but see, if I say favorite album, but it's something I don't listen to a lot, is that really my favorite, right? I'm going to go with Parallel Lines by Blondie, maybe. You know what? Let me sort my iTunes by what I listen to, right? And then we could get a good answer. Number of plays. Okay, let's do this. Um, these are sing all singles. For the oh, there's a lot from metric. Yeah, I'm gonna go with um, parallel lines only because it's such a masterpiece. So yeah, that's my answer. Final answer. I would like to start writing about liberty and anarchy, and I don't know how to start. Do you give private lessons? I don't give private lessons. Any advice? Yeah, make sure you have something to say that no one else has said before, because this these subjects have been beaten to death. So you have to avail yourself of the literature and go through the books and say, what? how did they do it wrong? Can I say something new, or can I say something old in a new way? That's what would be my advice. Is classical liberalism where it went wrong? No. What, what Are people who want to return to a diluted... I don't think progressivism is liberals in no conclusion at all. I, I think that's it is a perversion of liberalism. That I don't see how it's inevitable. I don't think... I don't see that at all. Um, trying to expand my world. First anarchist book. Anarchy and the Law by Ed Stringham. Which is right there as well. I'm not going to take up the shelf. Is metaphysics a waste of time? Uh, I don't know about waste of time. It's not for me to tell you what your time is worth, but I don't find it interesting. What are the best ways to promote ANCAP philosophy? Oh, that's easy. Just retweet Joe Jorgensen memes. Do you think the emergence of religion-like ideology messing with politics is inevitable? Uh, it's inevitable in the sense that it's enormously evolutionary advantageous to have people have that sort of devotion to your worldview. Because uh, they, they'll do a lot of work for free. They'll proselytize. There's an asymmetry in how much they care about what happens. So those are huge, enormous advantages um, uh, in, in that regard. When you did show with... a with Amico, you said like Crystal Castles, or am I mistaken? Yeah, I do like the band Crystal Castles. But they only have like a couple of their songs on my um, iTunes. How many of their songs? Four. So they're a good band. What's her name? Alice Bag, I think, or something like that. Alice Glass. I think they had a second album, which I didn't like at all. Alice Glass, yeah. Oh, they're from Toronto. I didn't know that. Oh, they had a new one? Amnesty came out in 2015. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, huh. All right. This That was a fun read, and I'm glad I did it. Uh, this weekend, I think we're going to do a one of those uh, YouTubes. Um, where I try different foods and drinks. I've got like the Sour Patch Kids, uh, crushed soda in my fridge right now, and a lot of other blue stuff. Will you do a show with Eric Weinstein? Eric Weinstein, I'd do a show with either of them in a second. Um, that's an easy one. Since Cathedral has found racial division strong in the class, I don't think it thinks that at all. I think it's just more contemporary. It's not stronger at all. Do you believe they open borders to introduce people they think they can control? Well, they're going to, they would want to open, they're not going to open borders, but first of all, you need the open borders. You need to just naturalize the illegal immigrants who are here. You've got millions of votes, number one. Number two is this, this white replacement idea. I don't believe at all that Joe Biden thinks in these terms. Now you can say this people behind the thrones and all these other forces. We forget Joe Biden was the establishment fighting back against the Bernie Sanders. And they did it very brazenly and publicly. I think people underestimate how much of the Democratic Party is under corporate control. And that's a mixed thing. Wow, Frank, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, wow. 
I've heard you say you don't believe in voting. I would like to know more. Sure. Can someone link him to my Guardian article Guardian article in the comments? I wrote a whole piece about it. Hi, Michael. How would you explain the clear pill? I wouldn't. I don't know what that is. It's Mencius Moldug's thing. Um, so I don't really know what he means by it. I think it means more the understanding that you shouldn't have your life be driven by what happens politically. And I think that that's absolutely accurate. But I'm not positive how he used that term. And I don't like that term. What city did you like better, Montreal or Toronto? I'm sorry to say it was Montreal by a lot. I remembered either Toronto changed or I remembered it wrong. But when I went recently, it was like another Milwaukee. Not that I've been to Milwaukee. So it was definitely Montreal, not even a question. Thanks for the Paul Johnson recommendations. If Trump said he would legalize weed, can you guess on how that would influence the election? I don't really think it would. I don't think it would switch any blue states to red. Um... And I think it's such a um, uh, like so, like an inevitability that no one's going to really care. So, one second. Ah, good times. Um, oh, there's 900 of you here. I can't wait for the um, when's the next presidential debate? Let's look this up. I got to tell you, not having nightshade is really helping me. Oh, the vice presidential's. Oh, it's tomorrow? Holy shit, I didn't realize it was tomorrow. Oh, fuck. That article I was going to write about Kamala Harris, it's not going to happen now. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Oh, okay, well, I guess we're streaming tomorrow. Okay, we're streaming tomorrow. Uh, I listened to Parallel Lines tomorrow, never heard it. What age did you know you were unique enough to appeal to an audience in that sense? I'm pretty young, pretty young. Uh, definitely by high school. Um, thoughts on VP? Yeah, I will be having my... Oink, oink, oink. It's going to be great. Thanks for the answers. Keeps me not too red pilled. My questions are based on many of the current new rights articles, mostly Blonde, Blonde Age Purpose Crew and Zero HP. Zero HP. Yeah, Nick and I follow each other on uh, Twitter. They they have such a um, uh, um, some of them. I'm not speaking about Nick specifically. They have such a uh, doomed view of the West. I I can't wrap my head around it given our history. If you were paid enough to host a Red Eye Like show, who would be your co-guest host and the best four people on? Oh, God. Who would be good for this? Who would be a good sidekick? I don't... Jesus Christ. I mean, it would... I feel like it would have to come from the circles I swim in, right? So it would have to be people like Lewis, Tim Dillon, um... I worry about, would Dave and I be too complimentary? Who else? Like, I mean, I would love, like, Neil Hamburger. It would be, you know, my absolute, or, or uh, Joe Mackey. Um, those are just some names off the top of my head. Kristen Tate would be sick. Um, she always delivers. I'm just blanking on names. Um, oh, God, that live stream. Okay. Okay, I guess we're doing this tomorrow. Yep, yep. So tomorrow we're doing a stream. Okay, I didn't realize that. I thought it was going to be later. So I'm going to have to... Oh God, I'm taping so many things tomorrow. Oh, just two. Okay, and then the live stream. Okay, then we're going to go to the gym. Um, I don't think their view in the West is doomed. When you said you're worried about Napoleon on Lex's show, they would celebrate it. Yeah, they would, but like... I, yeah, that's fair. But I, I don't think Napoleon in 2020 in America is going to be at all similar to Napoleon in the 18 whatever's in uh, France. Fuck. Fuck. This Kamala Harris article, it's, I'm, I fucked up the timing. This really bothers me. I, I, it doesn't matter. We can do it another time. I'll have to do it before the election. Okay. I think let's, I'll just give this another minute. Then I'm going to, um, uh, uh, bounce now that we have a um uh live stream tomorrow she's back to back good lord good lord i hope well, i hope you i'm i'm glad i read the book 
Thanks for the support. Um, I will and you please I'll, hope I'll see you on the locals and apparently I'll see you tomorrow night at the debate live stream debate. Uh, I'll talk to you guys soon.